Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and an assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And this video is part two of talking about rigor in, and quality in research. And so part one looked at quantitative research and part two, we're gonna focus on qualitative research. So how do we tell if a qualitative study is good? Um, so there are arguments about this, and it really depends on the perspective of the person who's making the argument. So within qualitative research, there's no definitive one way to have ensure quality in a study. Um, there are some general principles that I'm going to talk about, and um, they can inform qualitative research, but um, there are, you know, there's, there's a lot of different perspectives about this and the matter is not settled. So what you want to see is, are they talking about rigor? Are they talking about reflexivity, like the researcher's role in doing the research? Or are they um, not including those things? So this is something you want to see that they're talking about this and that they've cited either some theorists or some um, some frameworks to guide what they're doing and that those frameworks should be appropriate to the method they're using. So if I use grounded theory techniques to improve rigor, but I'm doing an interpretive description study, it doesn't line up. So you want to um, see, look for that alignment within the study and also say, are they using some kind of framework? Have the researchers thought about this and taken the steps to make sure that this is um, considered and reported? So some general principles are that um, you want to, so, and these are in contrast with quantitative research where you might have a random sample. In qualitative research, you one of the things you look for is that they had either theoretical or purposive sampling. So they talk to people who are experts in that phenomenon. So if you're studying, you know, loss of um, children from SIDS, you need to talk to parents who have lost a child to SIDS, not a random stranger off the street. So constant comparison is where each finding is considered with the other findings. And um, that aligns with concurrent data collection and analysis. And so that you are working iteratively. And so you're adjusting how you're thinking about your data as you go. So for qualitative research, if you're asking exactly the same questions in your 30th interview as you are in your first interview, you're not taking into account everything that's happening along the way. For these studies, you want to see lots of quotes, which is um, sometimes referred to as thick description. And also you want to see that the quotes have an introduction that explains the context, then the quote, then either an explanation or interpretation of the quote. Sometimes authors just stick quotes in and leave them hanging. But what that does is it makes the reader interpret it and the reader's interpretation might be different than the author's. So you expect to see quotes and some like discussion around those quotes. So if there's very few or no participant quotes in the results section, there is a big problem. That is a huge red flag. Um, you want to have some kind of conversation around reflexivity, which is the idea that like we are embedded in the work that we do and that you can't separate the researcher from the research. So the way I ask questions has an impact on the outcome of the study and have I thought about how I'm asking the questions and what I'm doing to try and make sure my questions aren't leading and that kind of thing. You also need to keep an audit trail. So um, similar to a prior video in this series that you are the records department, and this is true for quantitative research as well. You have to keep meticulous records. Who did you talk to on what day for how long and what questions were they asked? Um, so that if you ever needed to go back to a participant, you can. So sometimes um, with qualitative research, People can be a little bit airy-fairy about it, and I say that as a primarily qualitative researcher, 
but you have to be sure that you have a very rigorous, um, you know, tracking of how the study is unfolding. Otherwise, um, your, your rigor is basically just gone right off the bat. So the point being, you expect to see some of this language in a qualitative study. And so when you see things like fixed if you see the words thick description in a qualitative study that you're appraising, you then want to look and say, are there actually lots of participant quotes here and are they um, adequately interpreted? That's a good sign. Okay. Um, have they talked about constant comparison? Did they give an example of what this looked like in the method? Um, so you want to look for some of these general principles. And you may not see every single one, but you should see some of them. If there's no discussion of these things, um, you're getting into, you should be very nervous about that paper as you're going through. Um, so as I said, there's lots of frameworks and this is kind of controversial. I think the Lincoln and Guba um, and Guba's trustworthiness framework, um, these are general things that most people agree on. So it's not without controversy, but this is, this is kind of the most universal framework. So you want to see things like the, you want to look for the words credibility, transferability, dependability, confirmability. And then you also want to look in the paper and see that they're using some of those techniques to reflect those terms. So I'm not going to go through this in a huge amount of detail, but you do want to think about um, you want to see some of those words or see some of those techniques in the method section of a qualitative paper. So when you're appraising it, you're looking for those things. If you don't see those there, you need to be worried. Also, I just have to give a shout out to Lincoln and Guba. The, um, the first page of their book on naturalistic inquiry um, says, uh, we worked really hard to write this book and if you don't like it, write your own. And uh, I thought that was such a salty way to start um, their contribution to the research world. So if you ever get a chance to pick up their textbook, it's worth it just to read that first page. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that with qualitative work, you know, in the quantitative work, we talk about bias and, you know, making sure things are consistent and controlling different conditions in the study that does not exist at all in qualitative research. So um, things that I'm going to look for in appraisals or in appraisal assignments is, are you crossing over the ideas where you shouldn't be? So if you're talking about eliminating bias in qualitative work, to me, that would say that you haven't adequately understood the distinctions between those two things. So in qualitative work, there's no way of eliminating bias. We don't even try to we acknowledge the bias and move forward by kind of staking our biases right up front. And, um, and then you can judge the research based on that. So while the qualitative quantitative work has a lot of like, we want to test specific hypotheses. So we're going to control for other factors. Um, with qualitative, we know that the, the assumption is that you can't possibly control for things in life as lived, and so we don't try. Um, and we use a different paradigm when we're working uh, with things. So make sure that you're not cross-pollinating as you're appraising, because one set of ideas doesn't apply to the other type of research. And overall, some... If your research has no surprises, you didn't need to do that study. And so sometimes you'll see that they started asking questions about one thing and maybe they ended up somewhere else. But as long as they're talking about that and explaining it, that's okay. Because sometimes people start telling you things that you never expected and you need to respond to that as you're doing the research. So what do you check in a qualitative paper? Um, do the people in the study have experience with the thing that is being studied? And you want to say, have they spent a lot of time with the topic? So interviews, observations, focus groups. Now, these dep are vary depending on the methodology you're talking about. And you can have like much lower samples. So if you're doing a phenomenological study, you could have four participants. 
but I would want to see that somebody had interviewed those four participants like three or four times each. They didn't just do one interview and leave because you're not going to have enough data. Um, did they have a systematic plan or framework to analyze the data? Um, often people will use software and the software doesn't do the analysis for you, but it can organize it. Um, are there lots of quotes and are the conclusion for both types of research, are the conclusions proportionate to the findings? So if somebody comes out and says, I have, you know, cracked the difference between, um, you know, good outcomes in palliative care, bad outcomes from a single study, I'm gonna be very, very skeptical. So you have to make sure that the what the study is recommending as interventions is proportionate to the work they've actually done. So if they did a small study in a rural area, they can say, you know what, we need to think about these things in rural areas in this as we're doing this research. If they've done a large international randomized control trial, then the impact is different. But you want to see that the impact is proportionate to, um, to what you would expect from the scale of the study. So shifting gears slightly, there are tools that are available to help us make sure that we have high quality in our research. But it's not only those things that determine whether something has quality or not. So we need to start thinking about quality from the very beginning of a study, not only at the end. So we want to start thinking about how we're going to have good nursing practice the moment we walk into a clinical setting, not at the end when we're writing up our final reflection and submitting it to get our clinical hours. It has to start from the very beginning. So there's two things that can support this process and people mix them up and you want to make sure that you don't. So an appraisal tool looks at whether a study is, it can be appraised as high quality after it's been conducted and published. A reporting standard is a guideline that tells authors, this is all the information you need to have in your study. And so using a reporting standard as an appraisal tool does not work. These do fundamentally different things. So there can be a crossover of the ideas and you can see that, um, that you know, they, they are connected, but they are two different things. So it's important to kind of keep those straight and know what you're looking at and what it does. So when we look at reporting standards, this is the equator network. And so if you're praising a paper, it's usually helpful to go to the equator network website and find those reporting standards. And you want to see if the authors have reported the things that they're supposed to report. So um, looking at the uh, which direction am I right part of the screen, um, you'll see that We've got randomized control trials, observational studies, and then they have different types of guidelines, whether it's consort, strobe, prisma, those kinds of things. So you want, like with everything research, it needs to have good alignment. So you need the corresponding um, reporting standards with the, um, with the correct type of study. And if you see someone who says, I used a reporting standard to design my research, that's, that is a dead giveaway that something is wrong because a reporting standard is there to make sure you put everything in your journal article that you need to. It's not telling you how to design a good study. So there might be a little overlap, but they are not equivalent things. So, and also one other thing to consider is they may not check off every single box on that reporting guideline because there's limits on the word count of what you can put in a journal. So just because they haven't ticked every single box doesn't mean it's a bad study, but if they've only ticked a couple of boxes, then you want to proceed with caution. So critical appraisal skills program, this is really important because these are templates that can prompt you of things to think about while you're appraising an article. So for whichever method that the article is reporting, you want to go find the critical appraisal checklist. And this can help you determine is this quality research or not? Should we be applying this to patient care or not? 
So um, particularly if you're in my class, make sure you look this up and use the appropriate checklist to inform your assignment about this. So overall, you want to think about, you know, we have all these considerations in appraisal, but ultimately the thing at the end of the day is, does this seem reasonable? Does this make sense? So it's a little bit like if you look at a patient and say, are they well or unwell? And, you know, all of their vital sign numbers might look perfect, but if that person does not look well, then, you know, your alarms are going off in your mind to say, they do not look well, something is going on here. That same skill is very applicable in research. So if you read something and say, does this seem reasonable? Does this make sense? Can I follow where the authors are going in this study? And, you know, I have a PhD in this and sometimes I read articles and it's like, you've lost me. And I've read thousands of these and I can't follow what you're saying. So to me, that's a huge red flag because it should be easy to understand what someone has done and what they found as a result of it. So if you get that gut reaction that like, that's a little weird, then the answer is, is probably not high quality research. So, so at the end of the day, those are the questions you wanna ask regardless of what type of research or what paradigm or what methods is, does this seem reasonable? Does this make sense? And then from there, you can build in everything else. So that's a brief overview of quality and research. Thank you very much.